that's for me. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone in the house of the Lord this morning, and welcome to those that are joining us online. This morning, I want to just talk briefly about a passage of Scripture from Hebrews chapter 13. It's verse 7. It says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. I got thinking about that word imitate, because a lot of times I feel like there's a negative context behind imitating. It seems like you're faking. And I think with that idea in mind, to imitate faith, we have the option of being fake about it, trying to put on a persona. But in that same breath, we have this opportunity of seeing those leaders, considering how they lived their life, and saying, that's the kind of life I want to live before the Lord, using that as a model to model our own lives. And I think sometimes we think if we just imitate other people for the sake of putting on that persona, that we're just automatically pleasing the Lord. But I think it's so much more important to have that heart posture that says, I see these people that have been important leaders in my life, people that you might consider your spiritual mother and father or spiritual grandmother. And I want to live a life before the Lord because I know that the Lord is pleased with their life. And that's how we want to reflect in the way we live our lives. So as we enter into this worship service this morning, let's just stand for a word of prayer with that attitude on our heart. God, we come to you this morning. Lord, we know that we are fallible people. We know that oftentimes we sort of put on airs. We do things that we feel are pleasing to you without actually considering you. Just like with Cain and Abel, who each brought offerings to you, one was pleasing because it satisfied the requests that you made. Lord, what you request of us, we want to satisfy that. We want to worship you with hearts giving back to you. We want to praise you because you've made everything, everything that we are and everything that we have. We may hold that so close and tight at times. But Lord, we know that it's ultimately yours and always has been. We can't give you anything that you haven't already offered us. So Lord, this morning as we enter into worship, we want to praise you with an attitude of thanksgiving with a heart of praise that's not imitating to be fake, that's not imitating to put on a persona, but that our faith is tested and true this morning. 
and that our worship brings you joy. That the songs that we sing are a pleasing sound to you, Lord. That you see your people here at Curvinsville Alliance that are sitting at home singing along, that are around this nation praising your name, Lord. That that brings joy and brings honor to you, God. That is our prayer this morning, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm leaving my past behind I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus I'm reaching my hands to yours Believing there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me is good Is good is a day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is a day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. Trusting in what you say. Today is a day. fears aside I'm leaving my doubts behind I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you Jesus I'm reaching my hands to yours believing there's so much more knowing that all you have in store for me is good it's good, today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it And I won't worry about tomorrow Trusting in what you say Today is the day together. I will stand upon your truth. And I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I'll live for you. And all my days I'll live for you. And I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. And all my
seated. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here this morning. Beautiful day. Going to be a be- another beautiful day in God's yeah. kingdom. Uh, welcome you this morning. Uh, we'll p- go over some announcements here before we get started. I'm going to read going to read this this morning so I don't mess anything up. This is about, uh, in our bulletin, we have it labeled as gatherings. Over the past year, Kerbinsville Alliance has endeavored to abide by CDC regulations and guidelines. Because these guidelines change frequently, we ask you to keep yourself informed and follow them as they apply to you personally. As you can see, Pastor Steve and Laura are away this week. Uh, They're enjoying their newest grandbaby. And we're happy that they are able to do that and have the ability to go visit those uh, grandchildren. Um, I'm sure it would be nice to be more frequent, but um, that's just what God has in store at this time. Uh, Also, the Sunday school. Sunday school, we're starting June 6th. June 6th for all ages. I know uh, adult Sunday school will be... Uh, a gathering as one, but each of the children and youth age Sunday schools will be individual just as they were before. <coughs> and along with that, uh, youth ministry. Youth ministry is getting started again. I'll read this as well. We plan to begin Sunday youth ministry on 6-6 from 5.30 to 6.30 in the activity center. Junior and senior high students are welcome. Questions, see Brandon and or Deanna Root. They are our new youth ministry coordinators, and we are very thankful for them. Um, I think at this time, we would, I would ask those gentlemen who are going to take our offering this morning to come forward. We have Bernie and Helen with us here this morning. Bernie, I'll say you're probably like my Second favorite pastor to listen to, and Steve's Steve's probably the third. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Bernie, I love your perspective, and we all love having you here to share that with us this morning. Steve, I love you, buddy. You know that. Are you saying that Bernie's your first? (laughs) (laughs) Rusty, could you pray for our offering this morning? Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong Do not thank you, won't grow weary. 
Good morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here this morning in your presence to celebrate you, Lord, and the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Yes. We think of the past year and a half that we have struggled with this pandemic, Lord, and as we enter into a phase where we're starting to slide back into what we would call normal, Lord, we just pray that you would be with us, bless us, continue to bless us, and help us be accommodating and uh, mindful of others as we go through these transitions. We think this morning, Lord, of those that are affected by this. Uh, we think of the Thatchick family. We just pray that you would be with them. We pray for a healing for them as they, uh, they go through this time. And we just pray, Lord, for, uh, for anyone that's been affected by this, Lord, because it, it has been a struggle. We think this morning, Lord, of the pastor and, and Laurel as they travel, and we just are so grateful that they are able to, to do that, to go and uh, visit with family, Lord, and we just pray that you would bring them back to us safe and sound, and uh, we love them very much. We think this morning, Lord, of Drew and Julie as they embark on their new uh, journey together, Lord, and we just ask that you would bless them and be with them and be a strong part of that marriage as we know you will. We think this morning, Lord, of uh, Pastor Bernie as he brings the message to us, and we are so grateful to have him here this morning, and we just pray that you would uh, be with him and uh, speak to our hearts, open our minds, and listen for your word to speak to us. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Bernie. Good morning. How are you? So, um, I uh, suppose you're wondering what I'm doing today. I'm wondering the same thing. Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm wondering the same thing. How many of you, and, and here's the question. I'm going to start off with, you know, uh, worry, anxiety, tension, restlessness. Scripture talks, uh, I think, a lot about anxiety. I don't know about you, but do you have anxiety? If you live in this culture, I'm sure that you do. I mean, after all, do you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask? Do you... Uh, go into a place without your mask on, or what's the story? What do you do? What's the next feature? Life is uncertain, isn't it? And I think the older we get, the more uncertain it becomes. I, just thinking about our children, when Helen and I got married back in the Stone Age, um, you know, Things were so simple then. And I don't think we realized perhaps how good we had it. But the reality is, is that we had life pretty constant. Things were pretty normal. They, there wasn't a lot of changes. Today, there's changes every place you go. Have you been in the grocery store lately? Anyone buy groceries this week? What happened to the price? What happened to lumber? What happened to gasoline? And there's things that we still have to do on a regular basis that in spite of those things, we still have to eat and we have to find a way to get there. After all, there aren't many buses that run to Walmart, at least not here. So <coughs> what I want to do this morning is I want to look at this idea of worry and anxiety. The problem is, is that we often have different names for it. And the question that I want you to think about is who has who? What is in control? Or are you in control? Jesus said something that's, or not Jesus rather, but Paul says what? Don't worry about anything. How many think that's easier said than done? You know, it's like, don't worry. Oh, yeah, don't worry. How do you not do that? How do you not? And, and Paul says, instead, pray about everything. <clears throat> Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. 
Then, after you've done that, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I love that verse. I really do. But how many times have I walked away after giving God everything that at least I think I know how to do and I don't have peace, I'm still struggling, I still want to go bury my head in the sand and hide. I'm frustrated. I'm struggling. I don't have answers. I don't know which way to turn. And the, the ultimate thing is, how's it working? And I think like all of us at different times in our lives, it's not working okay. I mean, we're trying to do everything we know what to do, and at the end of the day, we still are going, I'm still under this cloud, this burden, this struggle. And the point is, is that what we think we're doing perhaps is actually working against us. And what I've realized is that you can't fix what you don't admit, what you don't own, or maybe you won't even. <clears throat> Change happens when I admit I'm stuck. You ever seen someone stuck in a snowbank and all they're doing is revving their engine and spinning their wheels and it's not getting them anywhere except melting the snow and then creating ice and so now they become more stuck. It doesn't get better, it gets worse. I want to show you some things because as I've looked at this idea over this last week of anxiety, Part of the reason I came to it was because for myself, I grew up in a culture that denial was as much a part of our lives as anything else. Well, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, is that I grew up in an environment that anger was a bad thing. And so we were not allowed to have anger. If you got angry, you were punished. You were sent to your room. Something was done. And so guess what? I learned how not to be angry. Is that good? I wasn't angry. I was annoyed. I was perturbed. I was frustrated. I was miffed. But I wasn't angry. I could smile. And the problem was is that denial becomes part of my life, my everyday life, and the problem is is that it becomes our life. And denial is nothing more than not admitting what everyone else can see. It's sort of like the king without the clothes. Everyone can see that he doesn't have clothes on, but he's walking around thinking he does. Isn't that foolish? Isn't that sort of crazy? Well, the thing is, is that I, there are common symptoms of anxiety. The feelings of being revved up or, or, or feeling on edge. Irritability, irritable. You ever dealt with someone who is just a crank? They're just like, now don't look at your spouse, okay? <laughs> but seriously, you know, you, you, you're, you're going through life and, and you ever find yourself just irritable? A lot of times, that's a symptom of stress. It's a symptom of anxiety, of worry. And you may not see it that way, but it eats at you. It eats at you. Restlessness, unexplained outburst, anger. How many of you, and I know you don't need to show me this, but how many of us, and I say us, get really uptight when we lose control or have no control 
or things are beyond our grasp. How many of you get real excited when the doctor's office calls and said, your blood work is back, could we have you come in and so we can talk about it? And you go, oh yeah, man, cool. It's really going to be fun now. Why can't they just tell you over the phone that you're a mess? You know, I go in after my blood work and they said, you have high cholesterol. I said, so what's new? I've always had high cholesterol. And, and they said, well, we want to stop you, start you on some medication. And I said that the problem with the medication for cholesterol is that all the ones that they've had up until now have an effect on one's liver. And I already have a problem with my liver. I don't need more problems. No. And you know what? You reach a certain age. Hello. You reach a certain age that it's like, I've outlived my parents. I've outlived their parents. I'm good. I mean, I'm looking at my classmates and half of them are gone. I'm ahead of the game. I don't need more medication, thank you very much. Do I hear an amen? (laughs) But the thing is, is that there are symptoms to anxiety and worry that we don't often recognize. And, and, and here's the other thing. There's hidden characteristics of people with anxiety issues that we look at as they're good things to have. I've taken pride in some of these things because they're, well, it's who I am and it's wonderful. I'm going to share these with you. And, and th- there's a whole list. If you want the list, I'll get it to you somehow. But This isn't isn't exhaustive, but I was just going through some stuff and I pulled these out and I went, oh, so many of these describe me. So here they are, outgoing, an outgoing personality. You may look at me and say, well, you're outgoing, Bernie. Well, actually, I'm not. You make me this way. I'm an introvert by nature. But to survive in this world and to survive in what I do and what I've done in my life, I have learned how to be an extrovert, how to have a personality, how to be happy. Bernie, how you doing? Oh, I'm great, man. I'm really great. On a scale of one to 10, what does that look like? 10 meaning you're really great. I said, I'm a two. But I can put on the face, I can put on the mask, I can be what you need me to be. But that doesn't mean that I'm together. And that's the problem with us. We all can do that. You know the song, put on a happy face. Yeah, well, it doesn't work. And the reality is, is that we can be dealing with and struggling with anxiety that Paul has said not to be. I love the next one is punctuality. I pride myself in being punctual. If I have to be somewhere at 11, I'm there at 1030. Don't want to be late. Now, I can tell you that if, I, if it takes me a half an hour to be somewhere, like let's say I have to be here at 11 and I'm a half an hour away, I leave at 10. Some of you identify with this, okay? If I left at 1025, getting me here five minutes before, no, mm -mm, I can't do that. That is like too much for me. This is like, I don't even want to go. I'll be late. Huh? And what am I dealing with? I'm dealing with anxiety. I'm dealing with uptightness. I don't care what you call it. It's going on inside of me. <laughs> I, 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 I like some of these high achiever. Listen, if running a mile is good, running five is better. If having an aspirin or two is good, having three is better. 
Do you get what I'm saying? And we do that, don't we? We all, I don't know if all of us do it, but I know that many of us do it. And the problem is, is that it's, it's actually masking a different issue. And the issue is, is that we are anxious and we're worry warts and we fret about things that are important to us. I have always said the reason that I am so punctual is that my father was so late. My father was late for everything. I have jokingly said he didn't even die on time. And I say that because his plan was to die on St. Francis of Assisi's feast day because my father had studied for the priesthood as a Franciscan. And the, pre, and the feast day came. He's in the hospital. We know he's not coming out. He's in the hospital. He wakes up on the morning of that day and he said, I didn't do it. I said, no, Dad, it doesn't work that way. God is never late. You know that, right? God is always on time. God doesn't worry or fret. Why should we? If God said he's going to do something, he's going to do something. I like the idea of helpful. You'll see in another slide that I have is one of the things that, in, let's look at the word helpful for a moment. One of the reasons we're helpful is because we don't know how to say no. Because we're, well, let me just go there. Let's just go to the next, oh, I need to change it up there. Now, that's even smaller, isn't it? But anxious people are often people pleasers because we don't want to deal with rejection. We want everyone happy. What do you want me to do to make you happy? Why do we do that? How many of you want and like it when people don't like you or are angry with you? What do you try to do? Fix them. Fix them. And, 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 and the reality is, at least in my thinking, the reality is, is the problem is that what I think I'm doing for them is actually I'm doing it for me. Because if you're okay... I can relax, I can rest because I've made your world good and I don't have to worry about you anymore. I don't have to be anxious about you anymore. You know how I can get you? Randy, do you know how I can get under your skin? I'll tell you later. You ever had someone do that to you? And I believe ultimately it comes down to control issues, manipulation and control. And we don't want to be out of control. We want to be in control. We want to, it's like gather all our chicks around us, all our things around us so we can manipulate and control them to line up with everything. And the problem is, it doesn't work. The problem is, as much as we try to control, we have no control. We have no power. The second one is talking a lot. Talking a lot. I have found myself in situations where I'm yak, 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 yak. And I stop and I go, what am I doing? And I realize I'm a nervous Nelly inside. And I'm compensating for it by talking. Nervous habits, playing with your hair. Well, I don't have that one. <laughs> but bouncing my foot, tapping. See, I just caught you, didn't I? <laughs> You know, I mean, doing the things, see, I'm doing this. Why am I doing that? <laughs> but now I'm, now I'm self-conscious. Overthinking. How many overthink things? 
Yeah. You see, the problem is, is that there are many things that are symptoms and are, can be a reflection of anxiousness and worry and tension that's going on inside of us that we don't see and we actually contribute what we do as wonderful and positive things and they're not. They're signs of something else that's going on inside of us. And the reason we're doing what we're doing is we're trying to bring calm and peace and structure to our world. Do you know the term Karens? You know what I mean by that? The Karens of the world? Why are there Karens? Why do these people suddenly pop up now? They've always been there. But the problem is, is that because of the COVID, they, are, they, are, they have no control. And they're overwhelmed by the things that are going on around them. And so they try to attempt to bring order into disorder or from disorder. And, and that's what they're doing. And we need to look and understand what's really going on because it's what we see is a symptom of what's happening of what's going on in the person. But we are no different. We're we're the same way. When Paul says, be anxious for nothing, how do you do that? I find that it's, it's not always easy. And the question of control and who's in control, whether it's controlling me or I'm controlling it, is really up to grab sometimes. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at all of these things and they're common in people's lives, now maybe not all of them, but someone said to me from the early service that, that they'd identified with most of those. So the question is, and, and I like to put it, so what, now what? And the so what, now what part is, Okay, all of this being true, what next? I mean, I don't want it to be, well, just so what? What's it mean? And what what does it change? And how do I change that? Because ultimately, if Paul is saying, be anxious for nothing, then, then how do I do this? How do I walk this life? How do I walk out these things in my life that are causing me this anxiety, this stress? I have said as I've grown older that I do not want to be a person who is subject to, uh, that my life is subject to the doctor appointments that people have. Mm. And it's gotten so. I remember I was in uh, the doctor's office recently and the person said to me, uh, when do you come back? And I said, what do you mean, when do I come back? I come back when I need to come back. Oh, no, no, we want you in more often. Are you kidding me? I, my life is not for you. I, 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 am, I go fishing or something. I mean, I'm not coming to the dock. Well, you need to. I got to admit, I got a little passive aggressive and I went out and I made an appointment with her boss and come back to see him because I'm not going back to see her. I don't like her. And so I come back in, you know, she's like, I said, how about six months? She goes three. So I made an appointment in three months with him. And I come in and I say, doc, you know, I don't like your PA. He says, yeah, a lot of people don't. I said, no, I, you know, she wants me to come in. And she goes, he goes, well, that's not her. It's actually the insurance company wants you to come in more often. Why? They never cared about me before. Now they want me to come in. They're trying to control my life. No, what they're trying to do is control, well, they are trying to control my life. They want to get me well before I get sick. So they figure if I come in more often and have more tests, they'll catch it before I get there. Anybody else get this problem? Or am I the only one? So 
how many would guess that I am not really very compliant? So, yeah. So I had a cardiologist appointment last week. I've got, I broke a tooth. I've got a dentist appointment this coming week. I cracked a tooth. Oh, I've got a sleep study to do. Hopefully, I'm going fishing tomorrow morning. We'll see. Who said that? But rain makes me grow. I love the rain. Fish bite better in the rain. Right? Come on, guys. Give me help here. <laughs> I'm going fishing. I don't know if I'll catch anything, but I won't be in a doctor's office. That's for sure. Here's the deal, though. This is what Jesus said. Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Do you realize how many heavy burdens you have in life? I mean, it, depending on where you are, I mean, you could be in high school and you got the burden of what is my schedule today or this week. For us older folks, what's my schedule? Do I have to, I mean, I have an app on my phone to tell me when to take medication. If it wasn't for that, I don't remember whether or not I took it. And so I check it off. But Jesus says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavenly laden. That is all of us. It doesn't matter where you are or who you are. It is going on for all of us in our lives. And this is what he says. I will give you rest. I want his rest. Look, I want his rest. I want that. But what do I need to do to get it? I have to come to him. I have to come to him. And I'm like many people, I'm busy. I've got things that I'm doing. He says, take my yoke upon you. We take the yoke of the, of the culture upon us. We take the yoke of our children upon us, of our grandchildren or whatever the case may be. And we carry the yoke of others and we stagger under it. We stagger under their issues. He says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, teach you. In other words, this is not something you're going to be able to do immediately. This is a learning process. Because I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. The point is, is that if we want freedom from the anxiety and the cares of this world, we have to come to Jesus. That's the first part. And then... We have to practice this. We have to learn it. He says, I will teach you. How is that going to happen? But I have to sit at the feet of Jesus in order for that to happen. But I'm too busy running off fishing or riding my motorcycle or mowing my lawn. In fact, I was thinking, maybe I have to go home and mow my lawn because it's going to rain tomorrow and I don't want it to grow beyond, you know, whatever. And even that becomes tension, that becomes worrisome, it becomes bothersome. And I go back to this, and Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. And I go get a cup of coffee, because that relaxes me. Coffee is not Jesus. Coffee with Jesus would be good, but coffee alone is not Jesus. He says, come to me. Take my yoke. Don't take the yoke of someone else or something else. Take mine. Let me teach you. There is so much in that verse that we need to practice every single day. And listen, when does learning start and stop? It does never stop. I don't care how old you are, you're still learning. In my case, I'm learning how to get up off the couch I'm learning how to get, stand up out of the recliner. You know, sometimes you go, I think I need one of the lifts. Oh, my wife says, I am not your lift. Figure it out. <laughs> Look at 
look in Psalm 37, 7, it says, be still, where? In the presence of the Lord. Be still in his presence. I got to get in his presence. I cannot get in his presence when I'm hurrying and scurrying all over the place trying to fix me. No. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Wait. How many like waiting? Like, yeah, right. Waiting? No. But that's what, that's what the scripture says. Be still in his presence and wait for him to act. How many know that God is not always fast? In fact, sometimes he seems very slow in acting. But he says, don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Don't worry about it. Now, the point is, is this, this, is, stuff, this is stuff we have to practice and the problem is, is that we don't practice. I know that's my issue. I can have a good run of three or four days of good practice. It's sort of like someone who thinks I've got three or four good days in, I can go out and play for the Steelers now. No. They don't even stop practicing after they're finished. They still practice. I've been married for 56 years. I'm still practicing that. I still haven't got it right. I was sharing with Helen on the way over here. I said, you know, honey, you're a late adopter. She goes, what do you mean a late adopter? And I said, I give you an idea and you, you just work on that idea for a day or five or 10. And then you finally come up, it's like your idea now. Because you just think it's a great idea. When I gave it, it was a great idea, but you didn't think so at the moment. You're a late adopter. And when I worked, when I was pastoring, I had people on my board that were late adopters. I knew they were late adopters. They had to think about things and mull things over. And I am, let's go! And late adopters get under my skin. Not my wife, of course, but, you know... And so a verse like this, when it says, wait patiently, that's how I feel. Might as well take a nap while I'm waiting. But do you understand that? I mean, it, as much as I want to do that, everything in me works against doing it. Jesus said in John 14, 27, I am leaving you with a gift. The gift is peace of mind and, a, and heart. Peace of heart, peace of mind. It's a gift. God, how do I incorporate this gift in my life on a regular basis? And I believe his answer is practice. Practice. Part of the reason is because times are always changing and we are constantly dealing with new issues. My wife and I went to an event yesterday. I had some cash money with me. We go in, it's $10 a piece to get in. It's $5 to park. That's $25 that I, that I know is coming out of the cash in my wallet. We haven't eaten yet and we're planning on eating at the food venues that are there. And I think we're going to be eating hot dogs because I don't have much money left. The plan that I had suddenly got changed because I didn't know there was an entry fee to get through the gate to walk in the dust. We get there, right? I mean, this happens in life. We go about something, we think we're prepared for it, and we suddenly realize we're not prepared for it. It's like two years ago, I walk into the doctors to get the results of a test that I had, and I'm told, you have a serious problem that requires open-heart surgery. Oh. 
Don't lift a thing until after the surgery. Don't even lift a pencil. Oh. Listen, denial is a wonderful thing. If you deny it, it's like it never happened. But I had family members that weren't in denial. And my point is, is that isn't, isn't, is God is saying, I give you a peace of mind and peace of heart and that that peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give, then I shouldn't be looking into the world to solve my problems. But the problem we do. And the point is, the point is, is that God is our refuge and strength. And he is always ready to help in times of trouble. The thing is, and I believe that the major issue in our lives is what we do not practice. What we do not practice. And what do we don't practice? This right here, coming to him. We, we go to a lot of other solutions. I, I, have, I have an eye watch on, and my eye watch will suddenly go, I look down on it, and it says breathe. Now, it's not because I'm not breathing, but it's an exercise of practicing deep, centered breathing. It's going, it's relaxation. Now, I think it's a good thing to practice. We have practiced uh, prayer or sitting with God and just sitting and listening to his spirit, not talking. I like the idea I shared earlier about taking what we call a holy nap. What's a holy nap? Holy nap is taking and putting music on and just sitting and closing one's eye and just sitting. And sometimes you drift off into deeper sleep, deeper rest. Is it a bad thing? No. Unless you're a person who is, who is focused on the things that need to be done and I haven't got time to take a nap. I haven't got time to take rest. I've got to go out and do things. I've got this to do and that to do. I've got to wash the car. In fact, I didn't wash your car the other day, so I have to wash your car today. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jesus says, come unto me. We need to practice that. And he says, come all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That's all of us, folks. We all struggle with this at times. Maybe not all the time. Some of us are different, but the problem is some of us do it all the time. We just don't see it because we have those symptoms that are going on, and we are functioning at a very high level. But we don't recognize that the functioning that we're doing is coming out of stress. So, you know what it means when I close this? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> the end result is do what Jesus did. Why is that so important? Because it says that we are to look to Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus did it right. He's the only one that's done it right. And one of the things that I know is, is that Jesus spent a lot of time alone with his father. He went off away from others to be with him. We don't do that well. We may pray, we may journal, we may read, but we often do it on a time schedule. We set out a block of time, and this is what we're going to do, and we set out to do that. It becomes, it becomes a goal, an objective that we have to finish. The point is, is that, is that what Jesus did, we need to learn how to do, and that is sit quietly at the feet of our Father and listen to what he has to say. We have to study the life of Christ You've heard me say to, 
before about living like Jesus lived, loving like Jesus loved, leading others as Jesus led others, and leaving behind what Jesus left behind. You can't do that without spending time with him. That time you spend with him will give you the ability not to fall under the power of anxiety and fear and all the other things that go with it. Let's pray. Father, help us, Lord, to to really be free from those things that, that pull us down. They don't bring us into a place of worship. They don't bring us into a place of relationship except with things that don't matter. Help us to find ways of being with you on a regular basis. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're willing and able, let's just stand together for this last song.
are the one we need, mm -hmm. no other. At the end of the day, that's the question. Have I leaned into you today? If not, reassess it and redo it again tomorrow. For at the end, you're the only one that matters. In Jesus' name, amen. things considered. <laughs> 